Hey, everybody. I'm Wen. I am on staff at a union of healthcare workers here in Connecticut. And I'm also have been a long time EWOC volunteer on the organizing team. And I usually am supporting workers organizing in retail and service industry because I worked in the service industry for a really, really long time. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to be here and I'll, I'm going to take you through how me and Benno, who's going to introduce himself really quickly is we're going to, I'm going to take you through some of the slides and then I'm going to pass it off to Benno here and there to kind of have him sort of, sort of show you how these things work in action for his campaign. So Benno, I'll, I'll give it to you and then I'll start us off. Sure. Hi, it's really nice to see everybody. I'm a worker at Urban Ore. It's a salvage yard in Berkeley, California. We kind of describe it as like a goodwill on steroids. We started organizing back in September of 2021, and we just won our certification election about a month ago. Um, it was a really long, arduous campaign, and Ewok was really instrumental, both like on taking these trainings. Uh, we did, I did like this fellowship series as well that Ewok offers that was incredibly helpful, and it was so cool to meet all these other workers organizing their workplaces. It was like really inspiring. So it's nice to see that that's just continuing and growing even more. Um, and that was like about a year into our campaign when I, we found Ewok and it really helped a lot in like catalyzing a lot of organizing and making things more structured in our campaign. So I'll just start off by framing tonight's conversation a little bit. I know that many of you all here are coming from various stages of organizing and also really different workplaces that vary greatly in size, culture, nature of work, et cetera. Um, but you'll find, and some of you might have already found this, is you know, as you start talking to your coworkers, many of the issues workers like all of us here face today under, you know, fists of greedy corporations and capitalism is largely the same, right? We're overworked, underpaid, treated without respect, lacking in health and safety measures all across the board. Um, and so although some things in approach might differ from workplace to workplace, I think that it's important to follow a lot of these tried and true strategy points, right? That And be diligent about adhering to these best practices because they work and there's reasons why they work and they're sort of proven to work across time and across different various different campaigns and challenges. So this is really just to ensure that you and your coworkers are setting yourself up for success because your goal here is to win, right? Whether that's you know, a really well-deserved raise from your boss or really urgent health and safety policies or a union or ultimately, you know, a really, really good contract that lasts mul like for multiple years. Um, the better structures you follow early on and consistently, the more you'll win. And the more you'll win, the, you know, the greater the shift of power will become in your workplace into you and your coworkers' hands, right? And away from the boss, which is what we're used to. So the first, I'm just going to go ahead and get into it because the first and arguably one of the most important steps to winning is to make sure that you're not doing it alone. Um, I cannot do many things on my own and I'm very glad to have people helping me out. And this is really what this is all about. It's you, you want to give your boss no reason to ignore you guys, right? And you and your boss can very easily ignore you. You come up to him. He says, oh, you know what? I'm busy today. Come back later. But if, you know, you get as many of your coworkers to do this with you as possible, it's going to be hard to ignore. So this is tonight is really about talking, you know, talking about how we do that, how we get people to do this with you and how we identify the right people. Um, and so what, you know, is an OC and why do we need to actively build it? And I think this is really important to act actively build it. It's an active thing that you kind of continue to do throughout your campaign. And the truth is, while your workplace may feel like it's an unorganized mess, you might not know who works what shift or who works in the morning, who works at night. The reality is that it isn't, right? Like we gravitate towards organic networks of community, whether that has anything to do with a union campaign, there are organic organizational structures that exist already. And building an OC is just getting people to help you tap in to those natural kind of organic spaces that exist. So whether it's, you know, a DD and d group that meets up online after work or like a rock climbing, you know, these are all things that I've actually heard that workplaces have or like a rock climbing crew, right, that gets together over the weekend or just a group of people that commute to and from work together. If you live in New York, you probably ride the same bus line or the subway station, right, and you meet each other in these points and there are these kind of shared points of interaction. And so the motto we follow at Ewok is in this graph, right? It's a, you want to get 
you want to find a team of respected leaders. And I'm going to get into it a little bit later of what the difference between a leader and an activist is, because it's very important, but also quite, you know, similar in some ways. Um, and you want to find a shared issue or demand, right? What do we want to get from work? What are we struggling with at work? And then you sort of build a campaign through engaging this group of people and engaging then you know a super majority that this group of people brings in of your coworkers around this shared demand or issue. So I'm going to actually ask Benno now. You know what is one thing Benno that you think that you made sure to do? I know you mentioned that you had kind of came into getting help from Ewok a little later, a year into your campaign, and so I'm sure a lot some of these models may have been followed, some of them may not have been. But what is one thing that you made sure to sort of adhere to when forming an OC that was, you know, ultimately instrumental to long-term success in your campaign. And, you know, on the flip side of that, what was one thing that you wish you had been more diligent about during that initial OC recruitment phase that, you know, you started to see in issues that appeared later on? Uh, so it's sort of like two sides of the coin. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing was just like having lots of conversations in the workplace and also just like getting to know your coworkers, right? And I think when I first started working at Urban Ore, and, and a lot of us came on around the same time, like in the middle of the pandemic, there had been this huge staff turnover. Um, like there, there was just like a lot of apathy, a lot of like, you could like feel the sadness in the room. And so you like kind of want to read like how your coworkers are doing. And then like from there kind of like map who's like, talking about what and and that like kind of points to this one thing here in like the organizing committee model of finding a shared demand and I think that's something that like from the beginning we really had at Urban Ore was like this shared understanding of like the issues in our workplace and like a pretty thorough understanding of like the power structures in our workplace too there was like a lot of resentment of the bosses and so it was like trying to shift that and make that something like productive and like how can we organize around this and like take action ourselves um that I think like we just had a lot of excitement and hope in our campaign to like do that and so that like was something that the OC from the very beginning had that even when we weren't like the most structured or organized it like really helped propel us and like carry forward with momentum I think one of the things we really could have like benefited from early on to get to a challenge was that like we we recognized that we it was important to identify leaders in all of the different like sub communities in our workplace. Um, uh, as, as you mentioned, when like you know you've got the D and D group, you've got the rock climbing group. In our department, it's very or in our workplace, it's very spatially segregated across departments that don't really interact with each other a lot. And so we wanted to find leaders really in each department that could be like important point people. But that grew kind of tricky. And I think like we just started to get excited about taking collective action. And we didn't like really take enough time to make sure that we had really like checked in with everyone before we just like started jumping into like doing things. And then that created some interesting like division down the road that we're like still working through as a campaign. Um, so I think doing that early and like really making sure you're having those conversations across the board with everyone is important. So why do we follow this model? Why does Ewok train folks on this model? It's simply because it works, right? There's proven work to this. And, you know, no organizing campaign has ever been won through a mass text uh, to everyone you know at work or, you know, a super strong Twitter, social media testimony, right? It's, you know, even the most damning news piece really won't get you to the thing you want to win, which is a campaign and eventually your contract. And organizing campaigns really at the end of the day are won through intentionally built strong relationships, right? It's through trust and it's through understanding and trust of each other and really standing up for each other. And I think when you when we've all worked for years and years and decades under really harsh circumstances where we don't have a voice and we are told not to speak up and have you know, a say in our workplace conditions, it can be really hard to imagine how anything different can be possible. And it can actually be really stressful to try and imagine that. And it can be stressful when you're being told that, hey, why don't we fight for something like that? And so when you're, you know, asking coworkers to join you in an organizing campaign, you're not asking them to do something for you, right? It's not a favor they're doing you. You're asking them to, you know, stand up for themselves and join you in fighting back 
together. And so I think that takes a lot of trust and it takes knowing that a, you know, a, a collective majority of your coworkers are doing the same thing. You know, it takes security, right? It's the safest way for workers to take action is to take it together. We say, you know, your best protection is each other. That's literally true. Um, your boss can not retaliate with every single person at your work is taking action together. And it creates, again, these organic trust, organic relationships based on trust, which our workplaces really try and resist us from forming, right? We go to work, we do our jobs, we leave. And it really helps, this model helps everybody that joins your OC and joins your organizing campaign to take ownership of what you guys are doing, right? Again, you're, they're not doing this for you just because they like you, right? They're doing this because they believe in it and they are taking ownership over it and they know what, the, what, what it means for them. And it, you know, you carry it with you, you know, into winning. These are muscles that you build that you use over and over again, whether it's, you know, winning a strong contract renegotiating successor contracts or even, you know, into a new workplace that you might go to next. I guarantee you there will be similar issues. And I guarantee you some of these muscles that you've worked in one workplace will work in the other. Um, so Benno, could I ask you to share a challenge? I know you kind of got into it, but I wonder if you could talk specifically about a challenge you faced in the early stages that when you kind of started working this model into your organizing, it really changed things around, right? Like if there was a specific moment or even a specific conversation that you had to just give people a sense of how this model works actively. Yeah, maybe something I could speak to is like early on when I think we, we didn't have an OC that like really fully connected everyone in the workplace, we ran into this problem or like also just not identifying like necessarily like leaders that like everyone that like everyone in the workplace like respected or like kind of resonated with different groups of people um we were like trying to have organizing conversations but like hadn't yet built that like trust and feeling of community and so like going into like there, there's this one department where we tried to have a talk with them about an action that we were planning on taking around a coworker who was recently terminated, not really like knowing how they even felt about that coworker. And like, I learned, you know, actually they didn't really like this coworker very much. And they were like, why are you even like advocating for them? That's not how I feel. And so we learned that it's like really important to understand the perspectives of everyone. And, and it helps a lot when you have this like smaller group of people that really knows everybody well and can meet together and talk about everyone in their workplace. Um, so that when you do organize around an issue and take action, it's around an action that's deeply felt and everyone feels like they're being heard. And I think later on in our campaign, especially like when we had gone public with the union and people were starting to like feel pressure from the bosses, you know, they were being brought into one-on-ones. Um, we had by that point created a better structure where there were leaders in place that people knew they could go to. And so they would come out of a one-on-one -on -one, and instead of being intimidated by the boss, they would go to the person that they had an established relationship with in the OC and like tell them exactly all the bullshit that the boss had said and like have a positive interaction about it, like excited that they, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, or I guess later in the training, you learn about inoculation and everything too, but they had already like been prepared for a lot of that stuff. So it was cool to see how a more organized OC had built that kind of, solidarity across the workplace. So this is, I said earlier that we'll show you the kind of steps to forming a strong OC and this is that. And I'll introduce the steps quickly now and we'll go, we'll break them down a little bit in, in the subsequent slides. But, you know, to frame this, these steps a little bit, I always, an exercise I like to do is, you know, if you showed up to work today and you found out a coworker had been unjustly fired and, you know, you and your co, you know, you and a few people decide that by the end of until, you know, you have until the end of the day to get sort of every worker to commit to wearing a sticker starting tomorrow morning, right? You want to show the boss that that's not okay. You can't just fire someone without cause and you can't fire someone out of, you know, retaliation and we're going to stand up for this worker to show you that you can't do the same to us, right? Or you can't do the same in general. And this is where this first step comes into handy, right? In order to know how to approach, you know, you want to know who would you count on, who would you count on to get the word out? And I want everyone here to even start thinking about it uh, in relation to your workplace right now is 
who would you go to and who could you count on to get the word out about the sticker action? You know, who would listen to who? Who would you have a hard time reaching because they work at a different shift or because the section that they work in is super siloed or whatever it might be. And this is where the first step comes in handy, right? The social map. And we'll get into this a little bit later. Um, but in order to know how to approach these challenges and reach your goals, you need to understand where social relationships live and, and where physically people are, right? And once you've identified your leaders, Maybe they're the ones that plan the parties or they're the ones that, you know, people go to when they're having a bad day at work or have a question, right? They're often really good workers. They have a good track record. They're off, they're rarely late. They rarely act up, you know, and you talk to them and you start building this relationship. That's step two. And then step three is really where it's all, where it's all at, right? Like organizing is all about consistently sort of commit, recommitting people to this thing that you guys are doing. Um, and you need to kind of do this constant recommitment and testing of your of people's commitment because you want to be able to stand strong as a committee through whatever the boss is going to throw at you. And you've all read all of the different union busting handbooks that people follow and do, and it's not pretty um, and it's very hard. And so you need to constantly be testing the commitment from your leaders, whether that's an OC member or just a kind of coworker in the workplace. And you want to give them, you know, some doable next steps to take with them, like come to a meeting, you know, can you, can I follow up with you about this meeting? Can you come to this meeting, et cetera. And I'll quickly go through how you would want to structure an organizing committee, right? So what exactly are OC members who then get recruited? What are they responsible for? And what does this look like? We usually at EWOC like to follow a one OC leader to every 10 people in your workplace. Um, and it's pretty critical that this OC is representative of the diversity in your workplace, right? So if a good percentage of your coworkers are older workers with kids or with, you know, families, it can be a lot harder to form relationships when, and, you know, and find common ground and find sort of like, and be affected by life and work in the same way when most of your OC or if all of your OC are recent college grads, right, that have only worked here for a couple of months. It's going to be pretty difficult. Not, it's not impossible, but it's going to be pretty difficult to build that initial trust. And so you want to make sure that it's extremely representative of the workforce. Uh, this goes to, this goes for if you have multiple shifts at work, make sure you have someone on the OC that covers each of these shifts, right? You don't want only to have morning crew or night crew. That's not going to be very easy to reach the people that you can't reach. And, you know, a huge reason why being upfront with coworkers you're recruiting about what the structure and responsibilities are of the OC is because people feel motivated when they know what to do. Um, I, when I know what, my, what the task is and how to do this task, I'm much more motivated to do it. If I don't know how, I'm going to not do it until I figure out how, right? And so I think that you want to set them up for success and build their confidence. And that's why you want to set up these sort of clear structures and communicate to people, hey, you're going to need to come to these meetings every once a week. Hey, you're going to be responsible for following up with 10 people. Hey, you're going to need to, you know, text people, call them this many times this frequently. This is how it looks like, right? It's a commitment. It's not something that they take and they hold as this sort of abstract title. And just before I quick, before I move on quickly, I just want to draw your attention to the this circle graph on the right side, which you know many of you, maybe some of you have seen. It's what we call you know the bullseye. And specifically, I wanted to talk zoom in on leaders versus activists, right? I think it's important to dist distinguish between leaders on your OC versus activists in your larger organizing circle. So this isn't this isn't about who is better at organizing or a better person at work, right? It's about sort of identifying individual coworkers' unique strengths and pushing them towards that next level of engagement that makes sense for them, right? So like someone, someone who is an activist is not necessarily a leader, but not necessarily a leader, maybe somebody who has been on staff for three months, right? Versus three years, but feels, but they feel passionate about workers' rights. They have courage, et cetera. And so, but they're maybe not always taking the safest kind of most collective actions. So it's sort of getting them, bringing them in and kind of guiding them towards using your leaders to kind of guide them towards better kind of organizing strategy, et cetera. And so this is, again, where literally mapping your workplace comes into handy, right? Where are the places that people congregate? Where is a place at work that you can talk to someone without your boss knowing? What types of bus routes do people take to work? Where do people go after work? You know, all of these questions, like literally, how do people move in your workplace? And so mapping is figuring out how your coworkers move, but charting is all about social relationships. And we've talked about this already, right? It's the who plans the parties uh, question. 
So a little bit about developing leadership, and then I'm going to pass it on to Benno because I think he's a great story to share here. But, you know, you've identified and recruited your leaders and engaged your activists. And this is the, the sort of smart goals is what we follow to identify, you know, how you develop a, a coworker's leadership skills. Um, you build what we like to call plan to win, which is exactly what it sounds like, setting up clear and reachable goals following, you know, specific, measurable, assignable, relevant, following these sort of tactics and steps to sort of achieve them. And I think in order to achieve these goals, it's really important to set benchmarks, right? Small incremental benchmarks that you can reach that, that, that show you that you're doing the right, you're taking the right steps and you can do this and you have enough committed people behind you. Um, Benno, could you talk a little bit about, you can single out one of these, one part of this SMART goal, or you can talk in general about when setting benchmarks is really important and, you know, just give us a sense of how that works with an action that you, you and your coworkers took. Yeah. So a, a couple months before we went public with our campaign, we, we already built up quite a bit of solidarity and then we discovered that our warehouse was infested with bed bugs and we were lucky to have like this kind of organizing structure already where we had leaders and activists in place that could take on like very specific tasks to sort of take action when the owners of urban ore didn't want to hire an exterminator and get extermination done in like a timely fashion um we had people that were kind of responsible for polling different workers in the workplace and like asking them what were the things that they were most concerned with around a bed bug infestation. We had folks that were then like synthesizing the, that polling information and they were tasked with, you know, coming up with concrete demands that we could propose to the bosses. We had people that were in the room with the bosses at meetings where we had, you know, a specific time set up to have these conversations. Uh, there were other folks that were helping out by, you know, filing reports with OSHA, putting it, we had like a whole escalation strategy that people put together. And so these were all like different kind of specific assignments and things that all had deadlines as well. Um, there was like a real sense of urgency. I mean, I think the whole experience really like taught us how to organize effectively too, like leading up to the union campaign. It was a real test for us, but having those structures in place, like we wound up winning a lot of things around this bed book issue. I mean, they, the owners wound up caving and like, after they said, oh, well, we can't get extermination for a month, they wound up finding another extermination company that could exterminate About two weeks earlier when a coworker of ours got bed bugs, we managed to get their extermination paid for when we were getting sick and tired of working in a place where we didn't know if we were going to bring bed bugs home. We managed to win hazard pay like $5 an hour extra. So there were all of these things that came out of like basically having people already in place to do all of these different tasks and together it led to this big win in our campaign. Yeah, that's amazing to hear. You know, I want to talk about here that struck what well, you've built your structures, you've set your structures, but structures need, you know, some consistency to uphold them. Right. And the single most important task to stay diligent with is to ensure and to ensure that your goals are being met and you're actively building on your goals, right? You're winning more and more with each step that you take and with, with you're building more power with each kind of win that you have, right? So after this bed bug action, how do you build, how do you continue to build on that? And how do you keep track of that? And the, your workplace chart is the answer to how to keep track of your success and your, your incremental you know, power building. And it really is the chart, it's, it's you know, it needs to be frequently updated, very frequently. I often ask, you know, I often say workers should update them literally after they have any conversation at work. Like every day you should check on this and update if you've seen somebody, talk to somebody. And it should be really accurate, right? It should, it should follow exactly, you know, you shouldn't write someone down as really supportive when they haven't given you exactly that answer, right? And you should be really honest with yourself because this is how you hold yourselves accountable to your goalposts. And so next next slide, we're going to go through a little bit what's in this chart. So, you know, you're going to have all people's information so you know what to call them, when to call them, how to call them. It, yes, 50% of organizing is truly just spreadsheets. I got a lot better at them. You're going to have contact info, 
you also want to put in major concerns. You want to put in this, this is where the social map comes into play, right? Like who is Benno friends with? Who does he come to work with? Who does he leave work with? Who does he speak to on the break? Who goes out and smokes together? And then you want, you want to have an assessment of, of how they are on the scale of, are they a supporter? Are they undecided? Are they actively against us and why? Um, and you want to put, you want to check next to their name. Have they done this, right? When we asked them to sign a petition, did they do it? When we asked them to, you know, walk on the bus, march on the bus with the petition, did they do it? And you want to start tracking, hey, this person has done all of these actions, but no one has asked them to join the OC. Why, right? This is a way to kind of, you know, find out who it is you're missing, who you should follow up with, et cetera. And, you know, I've, I've said a little bit about this already, but it's just why it's important. It's you, you want to make, this is the way that you make sure that you have numbers all of the time, right? You have a majority of people doing things with you. And earlier, you know, we mentioned, Organizing means consistently testing the commitment of you and your coworkers. This is how you do it. This is how you test their commitment. And this is how you record their commitment. And it's important because the boss also has a chart like this, right? They chart your, you and your coworkers in a really similar way. Who is talking to who? Who is slacking off on the job? Who was late? Who is working hard? You know, who told me this and that? And so it, it all makes sense for you guys to have a similar chart when you're trying to organize your workplace. And, I'll, and, and this is a, one thing that, that you know, is important to remember is that it's important this chart is handled with a lot of care and security, right? It can be really hard in the age of sharing Google Docs here and there willy nilly that things will get lost and things will get into the hands of management if you are not careful. Um, and you don't want that to happen. So, and it's also not something that your coworkers, especially those you're trying to engage, you're trying to bring in and engage with, should see without context, you know, since it's not always the best feeling to read what your, you and your coworkers have to say about another person. So make, making sure that you, only you and your OC have access to this chart and emphasize that if it were to be shared with someone, everyone needs to know. And we need to kind of actively and collectively decide on that is extremely important. Yeah, so that's that kind of brings us to wrapping it up with some of the core concepts. And I'm actually going to hand it back to Benno because the, the last question really I wanted to ask is how has organizing and following some of these methods changed your workplace, right? Changed your relationship with your coworkers, changed how you guys view work um, and the, the sort of workplace culture in general. And also let us know what coming next you guys have won your campaign it took a pretty long time and you know how are people feeling now and what's 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 happening next yeah thanks so much when i was just reflecting on this with a coworker who had joined like about three months ago i turned to him and i was like huh you haven't actually seen anyone quit urban or that's really weird i mean you've only been here three months but like when i first started at work it was like a person or two leaving every month and now there's just like a lot more energy and excitement and feeling that like there's a community at work that is worth staying around for uh you know there's a lot of things that like could still be better in our workplace but i think the thing that makes it a job that's compelling for a lot of people is that we have like a really strong network of coworkers that we all exchange ideas and you know feelings with anytime we're going through a tough time or someone is singled out by a boss there's you know 10 people around to like talk with them and work through that after and i think after this victory too there's just like a lot less apathy i'm seeing it even from some of the most like sessioned workers there who were some of the hardest to like win over in our union campaign just because you know, they'd worked at Urban Or for 20 years, some of them, and were making the same wage as me as like a new worker. They just never thought this kind of change was really something that was possible. Like the idea that the owners are the owners and like they set the rules and they get to kind of define the terms of our workplace is something that like now that we are certified and we have a place at the bargaining table is you know, even changing in their minds a little bit, like we're handing out bargaining surveys, we have a bargaining committee that like, one of these more senior workers is a member on now. And this idea that we can like, fundamentally change aspects of our wages and working conditions and other aspects of employment is like really exciting for a lot of us. Mm -hmm.